You know what? I think I've reached end stage pixel peeping. As in, if Sigma rounds out the rest of their i-series lens line to the same standard as the lenses I've just tested, I'm done. I don't ever need to do deep dive testing again because I trust Sigma and because I just don't need more. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant. And today I want to talk to you briefly about Sigma's three new compact, weather-resistant, optically and autofocus performant, I'll say, mechanically substantial, uniquely designed, sub $700 full-frame autofocusing prime lenses purpose-built for Sony's E and Leica's L-mount mirrorless systems. That's because even though I hate pixel peeping, I did it for you, dear viewers. Yeah, okay, I did it for myself, too. And when I did, using everything from a Sony a7R 4 to Panasonic's S1R, Nikon Z6 Mark II, and Canon EOS R6, yes, I know, wildly different resolutions, don't get your knickers in a twist, I shot the S1R at 47.5 and, and 23 megapixels, I had two copies of the 65 in both mounts, the a7R 4s 61 megapixels still weren't enough to overcome the trade-offs inherent to zooms in general, the R6's 20 megapixels didn't prevent me from seeing just how good the new RF 24-70 is, handily outperforming the sensor. And if we're really going to be picky about this, I should have shot at every aperture and, at the very least, near, far, and mid-distance under a variety of lighting conditions. Huh. Well, it only validated what my eyes already told me after shooting on the streets of New York and Philadelphia. This. It only validated what my eyes already told me after shooting my first video with it on an A7R4 and then shooting with it on an A7S3 like I'm doing right now. And that is this. As computer-aided design and manufacturing have become more accessible to more and more companies, I've talked about this before, and as independent lens manufacturers have grown more ambitious, the real-world differences in image quality between the very best and the merely very good, between original equipment and third-party lens manufacturers, and between, say, a $600 lens and a $6,000 lens, have narrowed, in some instances, to insignificance. In addition to street shooting, I compared Sigma's DGDN 65 f2 to the lenses I had on hand, Nikon's Nikkor Z85 1.8, Panasonic's Lumix 85 1.8, Sony's FE24-72.8 G Master, Canon's RF24-72.8, and Sigma's own just-released and outstanding 85mm 1.4 DGDN in the Bat Studio at f2.8 and 5.6 mounted to tripods using the self-timer and adjusting distance from the test scene when necessary to achieve the same object size within the frame. I compared Sigma's DGDN 35 f2 to the two zooms as well and to Leica's mighty Apo Summicron SL35, a lens I own, again at f2.8 and 5.6 on tripod with self-timer. In both instances, I learned that other than Sony's G Master, which is definitely showing its age and relative ambition, 
as well as Canon's newest RF equivalent, which, though impressive in its own right and noticeably superior to the Sony, is at the end of the day still a zoom lens with all of the compromises this necessarily entails. There simply were not enough consistent differences in sharpness, chromatic aberration, distortion, field curvature across the frame, even focus breathing when shooting video, to shout from the rooftops that one prime was dramatically better than another. I learned once again that physics is physics. There is a reason why MTF charts invariably show contrast fall off as one moves from the center of the image to the edge, though. Hey, you don't have to set your focus point to the center, and you can crop. Arnold Newman, anyone? Which, by the way, I'm talking about physics is physics and cropping. Why I now insist on high-resolution full-frame sensors for my personal street work. I can crop the crap out of an image, allowing me to forego big, heavy, intrusive glass. I learned once again what magnificent things are our bodies and minds because we, some of us anyway, can feel and appreciate very small differences in optics and sensor resolution without the need to pixel peep. We experience them in the context of the entire image, feelings, and that is the way. Okay, we're binge-watching The Mandalorian, much better than I thought it would be. I learned once again, how many times do I need to see this with my own eyes, that even with a tripod and self-timer, shutter slap can still show, so electronic shutter is better for this kind of testing. Which, on the other hand, depending on what or how you're shooting in real life, can introduce its own problems like rolling shutter. All of this is preamble, really, to the main point. One, if you don't pixel peep above, say, 200%. The $649.35 F2 holds its own against my $5,100 Leica Aposumicron SL35 F2 even wide open. It's not as good, but it's darn close, even at higher magnification. The Little Sigma does surrender ultimate contrast and color correction to the Sumicron. Focus breathing. But almost no one will notice this at anything near normal image size and viewing distances. And at f5.6 or f8, you're basically wasting your time beeping when you could be out shooting. Pfft. You could say the same thing wide open for 99% of us, 90% of the time. Two. Same basic conclusion with the 65 f2. It was, at anything remotely like normal image size and viewing distances, as good or better than the Nikkor Z85 1.8, Lumix 85 1.8, and most impressively, Sigma's DGDN 85 1.4. Holy <laughs> But before we go any further, a few quick announcements from our friendly neighborhood department of crass commercialism. First, our Streets of New York, the book, is back in stock and available at www.3bmep.com books. If you miss New York, if you or someone you love misses human connection, I think you or they will enjoy it. Supply is very limited, so order while you can. Second, our one-on-one -on -one video sessions are a joy. I've met the nicest, most interesting people this way. And whether it's a portfolio review, finding or honing your artistic voice, technique on the street, gear, or more, you can sign up for half an hour or hour-long sessions at www.3bmep.com slash booking. We will have fun together. Finally, if you like what you see here today, please subscribe, give a thumbs up, join the conversation below, and consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links, joining us on Patreon, or donating coffee money via PayPal. All of these links I'll place down in the video description below, but however you choose to support us, we thank you for it. Okay, what is clear and exciting to me personally 
is that Sigma's ambition for these new i-series lenses goes far beyond image quality. I'm talking build quality, industrial design, feel and hand, convenience, right down to a clever new magnetic lens cap and lens cap base that attaches to your bag or belt with a carabiner, which, yeah, I'd probably lose anyway. Joy. And autofocus performance. Though, it has to be said, even with a higher standard of AF performance than many of its earlier lenses, these Sigma lenses still do not autofocus quite as quickly or assuredly as the best of camera makers own optics. No surprise there, that's true of just about any third-party lens. The good news on the focusing front is that manual focus is surprisingly smooth and well-weighted, with a manual auto AF switch right on the lens itself, another departure from their APS-C lenses, which have no switch at all. In a nutshell, these i-series lenses are significantly smaller, lighter, and less expensive than the original norm-shattering, uber-performant, fast but monstrously sized, and too often dicey AF-equipped Sigma HSM art full-frame lenses on the one hand, without giving up image quality. Significantly meatier and enjoyable in-hand, aperture ring equipped, optically superior, and more expensive than their 1.4 APS-C coverage primes on the other, which Sigma accomplishes at the expense of one or two and a half stops of maximum aperture available in these other lens lines. I think this is a very smart set of attributes and trade-offs many of us will be happy to make, especially in this pandemic-afflicted economy in which we all find ourselves. The line between their art and contemporary lines are now blurred. Okay, not the best choice of words in this context, but you get the idea. Two basic questions remain. First, why the relatively oddball 24, 3.5, and 65, 2 configurations? Second, what about the competition from OEMs and other third-party manufacturers like Tamron, Samyang, and Viltrox especially? Let's take these in order. The 35 f2 is a time-honored wide normal configuration and really needs no introduction, but why a relatively slow 24mm f3.5 and why a longish standard 65mm f2? It could be as simple as Sigma trying to intuit where its L-Mount Alliance partners would be less likely to go, but I think it's more than that. It's about being really, really smart. Two compelling examples of the art of the compromise. I don't know about you, but 24mm just happens to be my favorite wide-angle focal length. More dynamic in my hands and to my eye than a 28, less distorted than a 21. It has been my favorite wide-angle field of view for half a century. I guess somewhere between 90 and 99% of the time, no one shooting a 24mm will be shooting faster than f2.8 or even f1.4 anyway. Today, most often, this focal range lies buried inside a 12 to 24, 16 to 35, or 24 to 70, 2.8, or f4 zoom. In any case, when you're shooting wide, you're generally doing so to share a comprehensive view of things. This is antithetical to the use of highly selective focus, usually. So, why do a dedicated 24, let alone a slowish one? Because it's much smaller, much lighter, easier to produce, less expensive, and can be optically superior to a zoom or a dedicated 1.4. Though, to be fair, my favorite current 24 is Sony's $1,300 1.4 G Master. There are times when I do like shooting wide that fast, even if it's literally twice the price and significantly larger. It's a killer lens, superior to Canon's much older and much loved 24mm f1.4 L2 USM. Maybe I'll change my mind about what's my favorite 24 once I can go hands-on with the Sigma. In any case, we should also expect to see both a 24mm f1.8 from Panasonic and a 24mm f2 Apo Summicron SL from Leica in the coming year, so I guess I'm not the only one who likes a 24mm Prime. It is also the case, however, that Sigma is not the first one to recognize the power of these observations. Until very recently, for example, Leica offered the lovely, highly performant little manual focus Elmar M 24mm f3.8 a lens I've considered many times. And there are a pile of 24 2.8s out there. 
Would you be willing to sacrifice just one stop for size, weight, optical performance, and price? Sigma is not the first one to come up with a 65 F2 either. Voigtlander recently released an Apo Macro 65 F2, which has gotten high marks from reviewers who've gone hands-on with it, but it's also a manual-only focusing lens, costs 950 bucks, and is currently available only for Sony EMA. But what is interesting in these days of social distancing is to contemplate the possibility that the 65 F2 is superior on the street at the now standard minimum of six feet in terms of subject size relative to the entire frame, and offers better subject isolation than a 50 or 45 at the same maximum F2 aperture, given how I shoot anyway. And again, the 65 is significantly smaller, lighter, and more flexible than an 85. But while we're at it, why yet another 35 F2 in an already crowded field? I think it's as simple as this. Many people buy that configuration, and Sigma thought they could kill it, and they have. Pairing the 35mm with the 65, even picking up all three, makes for a wonderfully compact, performant, and excessively priced street photography kit. What about other competition? Well, if you're an L-mount shooter, you simply haven't had prime lens choices like this until now. You've been limited to superb $5,000 plus F2 autofocusing primes from Leica, Panasonic's first prime, their just released $600 85 1.8, and specialty lenses, big, from Sigma, like their 35 1.2. Of course, if you're a Sony shooter, it's a different story. With a five-year head start and an open mount, it's not like Sony doesn't already offer a pile of excellent glass, from the aforementioned 24 1.4 to their $700 35 1.8, $1,600 35 1.4, $1,500 51 $800 55 1.8, $600 85 1.8, or 1885 1.4 G Master, which was our 2016 lens of the year. It's not like Tamron hasn't released their small, light, crispy $350 DI 3 Series 2024 20, and 35mm 2.8s. It's not like Samyang hasn't just released their own truly tiny, super lightweight $300 to $400 Sony mount primes in addition to their previous more expensive 1.4s, and they are crispy. It's not like Viltrox hasn't released their $400 21.8, and especially their $485 1.8, which has made a big splash. If you haven't committed to a mirrorless system yet, it's not like Nikon hasn't wowed us with their new Z1.8 primes, from the $950 buck 20 to $924, $700 $35, $500 $50, and $700 $85. Only Canon has been slow to offer modestly priced, moderately fast primes in their new RF line, currently limited to their $500 35 1.8 macro, $685 2 macro, and $200 51.8, though I've had none of them in hand, and as of this video, actually, none are available at B&H or Adorama. No matter. Every single one of the lenses I've just mentioned offers something special to the right buyer, but none that I have had in hand offers the balance I've described again and again of these new Sigma i-series lenses. Let's wrap it up this way. With the expansion of the i-series lens line beyond the original 45 f2.8, really a brilliant start in my book, I'll put a link to that video down in the show notes, the L-Mount Alliance has just cleared a significant milestone, along with Panasonic's recently released $2,000 S5, which is over there, and their promise of keenly priced 1.8 primes, the Alliance has just made it a very real, attractive, and accessible option to many, many more people. For Sony shooters, the tantalizing prospect now exists of getting Sigma art quality optical performance in a much smaller, less expensive, but high quality feeling package with some industrial design chops if you're willing to give up a stop or two wide open and 10 tenths autofocus speed compared to native original equipment glass. Shipping in late January and priced at $549, $639, and $699 respectively, I think Sigma's 24 3.5, 35.2, and 65.2 should be at or near the top of your list for consideration. That's it, really. Sigma, kudos to you. And thank you. <laughs>